Welcome to Home Group. My name is Rick Renner, and we are so glad that you are with us today for Home Group. We could hardly wait to get here and get started. That is true. We are excited about today. Who are you? Oh, my name is Denise Renner. We've been married for over three decades. My name's Joel Renner, and I've been your son for over two decades. <laughs> <laughs> Joel is getting close to three. I know. Oh, that just seems impossible. Well, it, can you, can you, can you, it's difficult to believe it, that it's been a week since our last home group. It time, seems like we were just here. Time flies. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm excited about tonight's home group. You know why am I excited? Why, why I am excited? Is because, first of all, we're a victor. We have the victory. We're overcomers. We're yes. overcomers. Yes. And I appreciate Amen. Jesus telling us we can be. Amen. And it's by the Spirit that we become overcomers. It's by His Holy Spirit. And I enjoyed last week how we talked about the windows of heaven, the doors of heaven opening. Did you like that? I thought that was fabulous. I loved it. I thought that was wonderful. That when God supplies, He really supplies. And when you come to his table, it never runs out. The food never runs out. But but I also enjoyed how he said that you know you don't need to look at the stuff as your supply. Jesus is, is the supply. Like like with the Israelites, I enjoyed that also. Have you guys had a good week? Very I good. Successful. Yeah. Very good. Successful. Mm -hmm. Joel, you've been doing a lot of filming. I have. In fact, in our in our church. Part of our ministry is we minister to the Vietnamese people of Moscow, which sounds different. There's a lot of Vietnamese here in the city of Moscow. But I went to the Sunday evening service for the Vietnamese, and they're in their Vietnamese language singing. Oh, yeah. And it is interesting. You hear the music, you want to sing the words, but you just listen to this language that's different. Yes. And I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. And it was, it wasn't a big group, it was like 50 people. But for Vietnamese people in Moscow, I think it's a lot. But anyway, as I understand, the pastor, his name is Pastor Kwa Kong, he goes to the farms, the villages where most of the Vietnamese workers are, and he goes there and tells them about Jesus. Hmm. And then every Sunday we have a service for the Vietnamese who do come. It's a powerful ministry. I think it's wonderful. You know, I think it'd be interesting to tell our home group what all kind of services we have every weekend, then we're going to get into the teaching. Well, we have a Sunday service, three services. First of all, we, we let another church use our church on Saturday. Okay. So Saturday night we have a full auditorium, but it's not our church. It's another church who In fact, Moscow uses our auditorium. Churches sometimes have a hard time renting a facility. Very difficult to rent a facility. We've had that Very problem. Very difficult. And we've even rented a facility next to a circus, and we went, went to church to set up. A bear was walking out the door. Yeah, because they were using our building for a circus. Yeah, the, the circus was using it right before we walked in. And so it's difficult for churches sometimes to get facilities. So we were able to use our church and help another church who meets on Saturdays. Okay, that's what we do on Saturday. Then... On, we're going to Sunday. Sunday, we start with 9 a.m. What's 9 a.m., Denise? It's the first service. Prayer for husbands. Yes. That's we're starting our first prayer. We're going to have a time of, for women to gather together and pray for their husbands. And I'm so excited about it because I want, I believe that women as wives... We need to find our place in prayer for our husbands, that we bring that support to them. Then at 10 o'clock, we have the, the service. first Sunday service. We have our first service, which lasts until 12. 12.30. And then we have the next service, which is at 1. 1. And the reason we have a full hour between our services is because we don't have enough parking. People park too deep. Sometimes they park three deep. So if you come to church early... You can't even leave when you want to leave because you've got cars parked behind you. So because of parking, we have to have a full hour for people to move out and for people to come in. Then we have a service at 1. Mm -hmm. Second and service. That service ends about 
three. Three, uh-huh. Then we have another service that starts at four. And then after our service at four, then we have... Well, then I have my service. Then you have your at women's 330, ministry at 330. 3.30. that's teaching. That's in one part of the building. Women about marriage. And then we have the Vietnamese, which is meeting in another part of the building. At 7 o'clock in the evening. At 7 o'clock. And then we have the homeless. At 8. At 8. Now, that's just Sunday. Then on Monday, we have Golden Age. Which is wonderful. Why is it wonderful, Golden John? Age, I think, is probably one of the favorite, favorite, most favorite things our ministry does, our church does. Because I just like the seniors. I like senior citizens. Mm -hmm. I think they're just great. Aren't they, they wonderful? They are. They, they always have a smile on their face. They always try to dress the best they can. They do. And they're so fellowship-oriented. It's just wonderful. It's just, when you walk in before the concert s starts, it just sounds like a beehive. And it's great. Mm. And I like how how the pastor of our home group, of our uh, golden age, talks to him. Very kind, very very gentle. Very respectful. Respectful. And they like him. I think that's a lot of fun. And then in addition to that, we have now started affiliate congregations. And so we have people who were driving two and a half, three hours, one way to get to church. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? When you drive two and a half hours to get to church just one way, year after year after year after year, you begin to get tired. And you can't really participate in the life of the church because it's so far. And so you begin to look for another church or people begin to fall out of fellowship simply out of physical weariness, to be honest. And so we have begun planting affiliate churches in those areas where people are driving two and a half hours to come to church. So while we're having Central Church, we also have our affiliate churches. And they're really taking off. I mean, they, it's just amazing. But everything we just described is only the church services on the weekend. Then every day of the week, we've got seminary, we've got uh, we transformation house, class, we've house got of mercy goes house on. of mercy, we've got... It's, I mean, that building is just buzzing all the time. We have men's prayer in the mornings. We have just general prayer during, during the week. Mm -hmm. it's, it's from Sunday to Sunday busy. Well, and on Saturday, it, besides the service that's going up, on upstairs, there are uh, business meetings. We're ministering to invalids, invalids and their parents. That's all going on downstairs. On Saturday mornings. In fact, I was I was just blown away by the fact that the administration, uh, you know, where the church is, there's around 500,000 people. That's in our neighborhood. That's in our neighborhood. Now, Moscow is approximately 18 million. 18 million. I want to say more, but I'll stick with 18 million. Well, it depends on what day of the week. So During the week, it grows. It gets bigger. <clears throat> well, we can say approximately 18 million. So we're just a small neighborhood of 500,000 people. And I was just blown away that the administration of, this, of, of our neighborhood asked our church to, to minister to these invalid children. Let me explain. When he says the administration of our neighborhood, he's talking about our local mayor, the, the local government of, the, of our region of 500,000 people. They have begun to turn to us and have asked us to minister to children, to invalids, to help families that don't have enough money to purchase clothing for their children. They've really turned to us and thrown open their arms. They asked us every first of September is the first day of school. So before school starts, they came to us and said, will you help us give away backpacks? Will you purchase backpacks and give these backpacks to families that don't have, they're not high enough earning income families? And it was just great that you see all these newcomers to church, people that are in your neighborhood. You know, they're close around you. And they get to walk into a church building where there's paintings about Jesus, where there's information, scripture on the walls. And they get to at least know there's a church in the area. Yeah, really, our, our church building preaches. I mean, the way that it's decorated, the art that's hanging on the walls, it's all very deliberate. Because we live in a Russian society where the Orthodox Church is prominent. So everything that's done in our building is very purposeful. So if you walk through our building 
our building will preach to you. I mean, if no one ever says a word to you about Jesus, you have heard about Jesus just by walking through our building. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very deliberate. And it's different than most churches, different than Orthodox churches. And it's interesting that the local administration does not call us a church. They call us a temple. They don't call us the Good News Church. They call us the, the Good News Temple. And which, I kind of like it. Which is the way they talk about Russian churches. Yeah, it's the way they talk about an Orthodox church. So it's a, it's a compliment that they would say that. I think so. I just, I just am enjoying seeing what our church does, what our ministry is doing. And I want to say that if you're a partner, that your finances go to help us do all of this. Uh, our Moscow church is doing much more than it can do by itself because you are helping us and you're helping us with television ministry, reach out across the whole territory of the former Soviet Union. Uh, we're just so thankful to you. You know, we, didn't, we go to prisons, we go to orphanages. I think it's just amazing what we do. It's just wonderful. You, you know, know the mayor of Moscow gave a award to the House of Mercy, which is, which is the ministry that reaches out to homeless children, homeless. And the mayor of Moscow called the person who runs this part of our ministry to the Kremlin, and he gave, she didn't know where she was going, so she's going to the Kremlin. Invited his, her whole family. And then publicly he said, thank you for helping the city of Moscow. Yes. And gave her an award. Yes. I just was, wow. We're so proud of her because she's been a part of our ministry for a long time. You know, when you hear those kind of things, it just puts a smile on my face. Amen. It's just wonderful. Well, I didn't intend for us to talk about all this. But boy, this our church is strong, steady, and stable. Yes. Just it's just it, it's just the truth. I'm grateful that God has called us to be a part of it. Thanks for letting us talk about it just for a minute. Yes, thank you, thank and you. And we hope that you feel the same way about your church. We really do. You need to love your church, love your pastor, get involved in your church, give everything you can give. You may not have a whole lot of time, but give a little bit of time. Can just involve yourself and you'll enjoy it more. It'll mean more to you. Mm -hmm. But today we're going to continue, and I believe this is number 29. Wow. <clears throat> well, today, if I understand correctly, reading on 271 of A Light and Darkness, uh, that we're going no to room for no, no room for compromise. No room for compromise. No, eh, yes. That we're going to talk about the white stone. We're going to talk about what is the white stone. And when I begin to study what was the white stone, because Jesus says, in Revelation 2.17, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, will I give to eat of the hidden manna. That's what we talked about last week. Was, that was just so good last week. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And will give him a white stone. And it continues to say a white stone with a name written there in which no one knows except him that received it. But today we're just going to talk about the white stone. And when I begin studying this... <clears throat> I'll tell you the truth. We, I had gone to Tel Aviv uh, because it's close to here and it's inexpensive for us to go there. And I had taken nine days to study and to finish writing the last part of this book. And I thought, well, Jesus is going to give us a white stone. This 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 will be easy to write. This Certainly there couldn't be a whole lot to this. And I began to study it and lo and behold... I found out that there are 14 possibilities of what is the white stone. 14. Where did you find those 14 possibilities? I, uh, through multiple books. This book and this book and this book and this book and this book. I mean, I, I, I had books absolutely... It's like I occupied the lounge. <laughs> and my books were all over the place. There was no one up there but me. And I found 14 different possibilities, but I summarized them and eliminated some that it just couldn't be. And we were left with seven possibilities of what is the white stone. Hmm. Now I'm going to tell you right from the very beginning, no one knows exactly of the seven, which one is it. 
but all seven of these are going to bless your heart. If it's any one of these seven, we're blessed. But I'm going to tell you at the end which one I think it is. At the end. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, let's begin. In New Testament times, small objects, coins, medallions, pieces of pottery, pieces of colored tile and stones, carved bones, all these things could be referred to as a white stone. And they were used for different things. They used all of these things. Number one, they were used as a token of admission. Now, you need a piece of paper, you need to write these things down because I'm going to give you seven points and I want you to get all seven of them. But since we don't have any paper here, I want you just to say it with me. Token of admission. Token, Token of, of admission. And we're in Revelation 2, 17, right? Large numbers of people attended big public feasts. And the logistics of keeping things in order could be very complex. So some cities began to issue small objects to the attendees to help the organizers plan for the event. These essentially functioned as tickets and were typically small stones. Everybody say small stones. Small stones. stones. Perhaps inscribed with a number or a short phrase. And as the people exited the event, the stones could be collected and used again at a future public event. Private events were very different. They were connected to trade guilds and had very restrictive memberships and had a VIP list. And to get into one of their meetings, you received a stone which had the name of the event inscribed on it or it had your name inscribed on it. So it was a VIP stone which was a token of admission to a feast. So it's kind of like a badge. No, it's more like a ticket. Hmm. So there were different colors. Some rocks. Bible scholars. And you're on page 272. 272. Left hand column. Suggests that the white stone that Christ offered in Revelation 217 is a reference to these tickets or invitations that people used to gain entrance into the feast during the New Testament times. If this is the case, then the white stone signifies a special invitation to celebrate with Jesus and other overcomers. The fact that a name is written on this stone lends credence to the idea that a small group of believers like overcomers have special places reserved at Jesus' table. Isn't that a blessing? Mm -hmm. So the white stone could be an invitation just given to overcomers to sit at the table with Jesus in a special feast. According to this point of view, Christ was providing an eternal incentive for those who are faithful in the midst of hardship by offering a special relationship with him based on faithfulness. But number two, hmm. number two, the white stone could be a token of athletic victory. Okay, Mama. Athletic victory. Everybody say, token of athletic victory. A token of, of athletic, athletic victory. victory. Okay, we, what was number one? Token of admission. Token of admission. Mama. Tokens are small white stones. Number two is? Token, token of, of athletic, athletic, athletic victory. victory. Greeks and Romans were obsessed with victory in every area of life whether it was in the military, politics, intellectual endeavors, or athletics, they loved to win. By the first century, the Romans had become masters of the ancient world, and they liked to believe there was nothing they could not conquer. And as a result, they developed an obsession with athletics and having the mastery over everyone in the athletic games. And just as, uh, next page, top, top column, just as famous athletes today are paid enormous sums of money, superior athletes in Greek and Roman society were compensated handsomely. If an athlete had a particularly long and victorious career, he might be awarded with a symbolic what ticket that entitled him to special rewards such as a dinner, fame, or financial reward. 
that ticket could be an object as simple as an inscribed stone. There you have it again. And some scholars suggest because the white stone Revelation 2.17 was offered only to those who overcame, Christ was referring, referencing the stones given to athletes as symbols of their victory. The fact that the champion's names and the nature of his reward were often inscribed on the stone supports this idea as well. If this interpretation is correct, Christ was offering a divine incentive for believers to remain faithful even in the midst of difficulty. Those who stayed in the fight of faith and overcame the obstacles against them would receive an eternal reward and be memorialized in heaven and for all of eternity. If Christ had this imagery in mind when he promised a white stone to overcomers, this meaning would have also provided a powerful incentive for these early believers to remain faithful even in the midst of difficulty. So now we've had two. We've had the token of admission. Mission, admission. Number two. Token of athletic token victory. Of athletic, of athletic victory. victory. Now number three. The token of gladiatorial, gladiatorial discharge. Now we're going to talk about gladiators. Little white stones had to do with all of these different functions. They were tokens. Little white stones. It would have been almost impossible to live in the Roman Empire during the first century and not know about gladiators. Although many gladiators didn't live long, once they began fighting in the arena, there were some professional gladiators who fought for years without dying, scoring multiple successes and earning large sums of money for their owners. Although their bodies bore the scars of multiple wounds, these gladiators survived and were adored by the public because they were such good fighters. Upon entering a gladiator school to begin training, recruits took an oath that bound them to fight until death. Now listen to this and you'll see how this could have application to overcomers. They took an oath that bound them to fight until death. That oath was called the Sacramentum, Gladiatorium, and it read, this is what it read, I will endure to be burned by fire, bound in chains, to be beaten, to die by sword. In essence, the oath proclaimed that once an individual became, Denise, it's page 274. Oh, oh okay. Once, uh, in essence, this oath proclaimed that once an individual became a gladiator, he would always remain a gladiator, and that as a gladiator, he was committed to endure any abuse in order to perform faithfully. I'm going to read that again. In essence, this oath proclaimed that once an individual became a gladiator, he would always remain a gladiator, and that as a gladiator, he was committed to endure any abuse in order to perform faithfully. Gladiators could receive many kinds of rewards during their span of their careers, including symbolic gestures of glory, like laurel wreaths, or even large sums of money. If a gladiator survived a long and illustrious career and was deemed especially faithful due to his years of sustained victory, don't you like that sustained victory? He might be rewarded with an object made of stone, and on the stone, the letters SP were engraved. SP are believed to be an abbreviation for the Latin word spectacus, which means tested and proven. Hmm. If this was awarded to a gladiator, he was released from the need to ever enter the arena and risk his life again. If this was the image Christ had in mind when he promised a white stone to the believers in Pergamum, then he was acknowledging the fight that had been thrust upon them and their commitment to be faithful unto the end. Just like a gladiator's oath bound him to fight until death and endure anything necessary to remain faithful, Christians, now listen to this, were called to remain fervently committed to the faith no matter what challenges lie before them. Many of the Pergamene believers died for what they believed. Yet this is what Jesus expected of them, for their devotion proved their valor had been tested 
and proven beyond doubt. Successful gladiators were often famous and illustrious individuals. Thus, when Christ offered a white stone to anyone who overcomes, it is certainly possible that he was referring to the special token sometimes given to premier gladiators as both an acknowledgement and a promise of reward for his success. Isn't that something? Mm. So first of all, it's a token of admission, inviting us to a special feast with Jesus. Secondly, it could be a token of athletic victory, athletic victory or great glory. Number four. Are you ready for this? Denise, you're going to like number four. When two people entered a covenant, they could finalize it symbolically by writing their name on a small flat piece of stone. Stone was the most enduring of all materials and therefore was most often used. Once the names of the two covenant parties had been inscribed on the stone, it was broken into two halves and each participant took a piece home. If strife ever arose between those two individuals or their families, they would come together and produce their respective halves of the covenant symbol. As the two parties placed the pieces together to make one whole stone, that would bring renewed clarity to the promises and commitments of the covenant. Hmm. The stone, as one whole piece, was a reminder to both parties that whatever the difficulty, the covenant remained inviolated. Inviolate. In most cases, the terms of the covenant were so binding that they carried into subsequent generations. It was literally a promise set in stone, one that was never to be intended to be broken. Hmm. The covenant stones used in ancient times are where we get the half heart necklaces and bracelets. You know what I'm talking about, Denise? Mm -hmm. Where you have a half a heart and Mm -hmm. you wear half of it and somebody else wears Mm -hmm. the other half and you put the two pieces together and it makes a whole. On its own, each half looks incomplete, but when the two pieces are placed together, they form a complete heart. By depicting the two people are needed to make a whole love, this heart symbol pictures the lover's covenant promise to each other. This symbolic concept of covenant relationship carried much more weight in Roman times than it does today. In fact, a stone made of two matching halves with mutual promises inscribed on it was considered sufficient legal evidence to prove a binding contract of covenant since the accidental likelihood of two matching pieces was almost impossible. If this is what Christ meant when he referred to a white stone, he was reminding the believers in Pergamum that they were in covenant with him. Alone, they had nothing to stand on, but with Jesus at their side, holding the other piece of their covenant stone, they had a promise they could rely on even in the most troubling times. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm Mm-hmm. It's a strong possibility that that's what it means. Number five, token of authentication. Let's all say it. Token Token of of authentication. authentication. A great debasement of currency occurred after the Great Fire of Rome in 64. Now, this is real long, so I'm just going to tell you about this debasement of currency. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Nero wanted to do a whole lot more than he had money to do. To rebuild the city? He wanted to rebuild the city. He wanted to build his big house. He wanted, I mean, he had lots of plans, and there just was not enough money to do everything that he wanted to do. So Nero came up with a great scheme to remove from the silver coins silver and to put bronze in the middle. So on the exterior, it had a small layer of silver, but on the inside, it was just bronze. And to the eye, it looked like a regular coin. And it was great trickery. And he was so good at it that other imperial leaders after him learned the trick of the trade. And this became something that everyone did. Everybody began to do. And it was the debasing of the currency by removing the silver from the coins and filling the interior with bronze. It was just pulling tricks on the people. So... The practice of falsifying coins continued through subsequent emperors eventually becoming so severe 
that a process was implemented to prove whether or not a coin was legitimate, attempting to determine the trustworthiness of a coin by simply judging its weight or giving it a quick visual inspection was insufficient to uncover the deception. Therefore, coins were thoroughly analyzed, deemed, inspected, and scrutinized with a series of tests. Once a batch of coins had been proven to be genuine, it was bagged and tagged. Don't you like? That's very important in this contest. It was bagged and tagged with a piece of clay a piece of clay that declared it had passed official inspection and was therefore genuine. That piece of clay was a token of authentication. Mm -hmm. Some Bible scholars believe that when Jesus promised a white stone to believers in Pergamum who overcame, he was referring to this specific kind of tag. Pergamum was a powerful, rich city where coins were minted. Therefore, the idea of bagging and tagging coins would not be an uncommon idea to the recipients of this message. If the tagging of coins was indeed the metaphor that Christ had in mind when he spoke of the white stone, this illustration would have held a unique significance to the Pergamon congregation. Believers in Pergamum, skip a paragraph, had been exposed to intense opposition. But in spite of the great difficulties, there were many who refused to budge no matter what came against them. The intense scrutiny they endured tested them and revealed whether or not they were truly pure in their commitment to Christ. Hence, some believe that when Jesus offered a white stone to the believers who overcame, he was essentially saying, you've been inspected, tested, and tried by many circumstances that would have revealed if you were inwardly impure. And these events have proven you to be trustworthy and true Therefore, I am putting my seal of approval upon you. This was a token of approval. Authentication. authentication. Then we come to number six, which is the token of access into the spiritual realm. Let's say it together. Token, token of access, access into, into, the, spiritual spiritual realm. into the spiritual realm. Now, I told you this was going to be a lot of reading. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Yep. In our contemporary world... And I'm just going to say this. People who are involved in the New Age movement, uh, what do they wear very often around their necks? Um, crystals. Amulet. Amulets. Uh -huh. They wear crystals. Uh -huh. And they think that these crystals have the power to connect them to the spirit world. To the world. spirit world. They, they think it's very spiritual. They wear crystal bracelets, crystal rings, crystals in their ears. Like it has energy in it. They believe it has energy. Connecting them to the universe. It connects them to the universe. Denise, you've, you've got it completely. <laughs> this is not a new practice. This is a very old practice which goes all the way back to the first century and even earlier than that. It's been around for thousands of years. Pagans believed that amulets had the power to connect them to spiritual dimensions in the same way that New Age people think crystals do today. One type of amulet that was popular in the first century was a small object such as a stone that bore the name of a god or a secret magic phrase. These items could be carried loosely in a pocket or bag, attached to a string or chain and hung around the wrist or neck, or be worn as earrings or even set into a ring. It kind of sounds like the New Age movement, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Next paragraph, the, skip a paragraph. William Barclay, theologian, explains, one of the most common of all customs in the ancient world was to carry a small lucky charm. It might be made of precious metal or of a precious stone, but often it was nothing more than a pebble. On the pebble there was a sacred name. To know a god's name was to have certain power over that god, to be able to summon him to one's aid in time of difficulty, or to have control over the demons. Such an object was thought to be doubly effective if no one but the owner knew the name that was inscribed upon it. Barclay continues to allude that Christ's reference to the white stone could mean to the former pagan believers who had become Christians. Your friends, your friends, and you did the same in the days before you became a Christian. You carried charms with superstitious inscriptions on them, and they think that they will keep them safe. 
You need nothing like that. You're safe in life and in death because you know the name of the one only true God. Barclay was so convinced of this interpretation that he concluded his commentary stating this is most likely the best possible interpretation for the white stone with a new name. If Jesus was referring to these amulets, then he was proclaiming to the overcomers that they did not need a pebble inscribed with names of strange gods because they had received the ultimate gift, authority in Jesus' name. His name is above every other name and the only name by which men could be saved. Hmm. Yet there is one more interpretation of the white stone that must be taken into serious consideration. Serious consideration. Number seven. And this is what I believe. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Ready. So let's let's review real quick. Okay. We've had number one, token, token of, of admission. 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 Mm -hmm. Number two, token, token of, of athletic, athletic victory. victory. Number three, token, token of, of gladiatorial, gladiatorial discharge. discharge. Number four, token, token of, of covenant. covenant. Number five, to token, token of authentication. authentication. Number six, token, token of access, access into, into the spiritual realm. realm. And number seven, to token, token of, of a favorable, favorable vote. vote. Let's say it again. Token, token of, of a favorable, favorable vote. As we have seen, there are many different possible interpretations of the white stone based on all these objects. However, there is one very important fact that must be added to this discussion. When one looks at the original Greek text of Revelation 2.17, it is evident that the phrase a white stone is ordered differently in Greek. Rather than a white stone, the Greek reads a stone, a white one. Did you get me? Mm -hmm. A stone, a white one. This phrase seems to lay particular emphasis on the color of the stone. So we must examine the primary way white stones were used in New Testament times. And they were used for casting a vote. You see, all these other stones we've looked at, they could be multicolored stones. They could be flesh-colored stones. They could be bone-colored stones. But now we're talking specifically, we're seeing that Jesus says it's a stone, a white one. Now this is very important. Next paragraph. When a Roman trial concluded, and it was time for a panel of judges to vote for the defendants, innocence or guilt, the judges registered their votes by casting a black or white stone hmm. into a vase. Hmm. A black stone symbolized a vote for guilt, mm -hmm. and a white stone denoted a vote for innocence. Mm. When all the votes had been cast, meaning all stones had been thrown, the stones were emptied from the vase and counted one by one. If there were more black stones, it meant the jury had found the defendant guilty. If there were more white stones, it meant they had determined the individual to be not guilty. Not guilty. Therefore, when Christ offered a stone, a white one, to the overcomers in Pergamum, placing a definite emphasis on the word white, it could simply mean, I have reviewed all the evidence, and I am casting a white stone in your favor. Hmm. Now, this is what I believe it means. Perhaps this congregation struggled with memories from their pagan background. Living in the midst of the former environment in Pergamum may have made it difficult for these believers to forget their lives before Christ. Yet Jesus' message to them was that regardless of who they had been or what they had done, what mattered to him was who they had become in him. Hmm. Viewing them in the light of his blood, Jesus had cast a stone, hmm. a white one, in their direction, hmm. resulting in their full acquittal and complete release from their past and sinful life. Therefore, when the devil or any person, for that matter, tries to throw a stone of judgment against us by mentally tormenting us about past actions we've, for which we've already been forgiven, we may boldly answer, Christ has reviewed all the evidence, already cast his vote, and has found me innocent. Hmm. Regardless of any actions we may have committed in the past, Jesus' blood has purged our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The ancient group, Greeks, also used white and black stones for different type of vote casting. 
one of the greatest privileges in Greek society was to vote about civic issues in a public election. In these elections, people used white and black stones or beans to cast their votes, similar to the way that stones were used in legal trials. Votes were customarily registered by casting a white or black pebble into a large vase, just like we've already talked about. When the time of voting had concluded, the pebbles were separated hmm. into white and black piles and then counted. Hmm. A white stone represented a person voting in favor of an issue, whereas a black stone represented a person who was voting against an issue. Thus, when Christ promised a stone, a white one, to believers who overcame, it is entirely possible that he was not only announcing freedom, forgiveness, and acquittal from a past sinful life, but he was also telling them, in a world where it feels like you've lost your voice and no one stands with you anymore, where you've been discarded and treated with contempt by society, I'm officially registering my vote. Mm -hmm. My vote is for you. I'm casting the one vote that counts more than any others. It's mm -hmm. mine. And I'm putting my full support behind you. Mm. To be honest, it may not be possible for any scholar to state the meaning of this white stone with absolute certainty, but it is my personal conviction that the token of a favorable vote is what the white stone represents. I agree with you. Wow. That's awesome, Rick. Isn't it powerful? Mm -hmm. Any one of them would be powerful. Mm -hmm. Or let's take all of them. We're gladiators. We're athletes. We've been invited to the table with Jesus. A mission. Mm -hmm. All of these things have application to us. But it says with a name written. A new name written, which no man knows except the one that received it. And it says saving he that receiveth it. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover that in today's home group. So we're going to talk about it next week. And we're going to talk about what is the secret name. It's a good idea. I mean, ac according to this scripture, a white stone's been cast in my favor, and it's got a name written on it that only I know. But, only you know. <clears throat> only you know. But it says, saving he that receiveth it. So saving I, he that received it. So if I was on trial and Jesus cast a white stone, that would be saving me. No, it means that you, you would be the only one that would know the name written on it. Oh, okay. okay. Christ concluded his message to the angel and congregation of Pergamum by saying, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone, now we've already seen the seven possibilities for the white stone. And a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving or accept he that receives it. And that's where we're going to start next week's home group. I'm sorry it was a lot of reading today, but I don't know how else to do this. That was very intriguing. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Really. Very good, very good. If you're watching home group, would you chat with me and let me know if this has been helpful to you or if it's opened your eyes or... Tell, tell me what you think. Which, which, which one do you think it is? Remember, there were 14 total possibilities when I started my study. And some of them, when you looked at they just were not possibilities. But you got it down to seven. Got it down to seven. But really, I think it's one because it's a stone, a white a, one. A white one. A white. It's very specific. It's a stone, a white one. But Mr. Barclay says, William Barclay, he thinks... I assume he thinks that it was the um, token access of access to spiritual, to spiritual power. Letting people know that you used to be like those pagans also. So there's possibilities here. And you know what? There are some scriptures that we don't have definite answers about. But we have enough here to make me want to say amen. Amen. Yes. yes. So that's where we're going to start when we come back next Monday night. Thank you. It was great, Rick. Thank you. Thank you for your study. You're very welcome. So to those who, who are faithful to the end, overcome. And they'll be given a white stone. A white one. A white they'll one. be given a stone, a white one. A white one. And manna. Oh, yeah. The hidden manna. They're going to be given hidden manna and a white stone. 
Actually, when you look at all seven of these churches, every overcomer is promised something different. Uh, it, it pays to be an overcomer. Mm -hmm. Amen. I mean, there's a price to pay, but there is a reward to be had. That's right. Thank you. Amen. Very encouraging. All right, what are we taking home? I'm taking home a white stone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm taking home that if I stay faithful to the end I am the overcomer and Jesus will cast his vote in any case but I want to be a white one I want to be him for me Denise I'd say the same about I want Jesus to throw in that white stone for me Amen what about you well I wrote it so I'm kind of taking it all home for me this this is a review that it blesses me that jesus has cast his vote in my favor yeah amen yes amen. thank you well if you don't have a copy of no room for compromise i want to encourage you to get one at renner.org and you know there's so much more i, I mean i'm going to tell you that there are major sections of this marked out. Do you see? I'm not reading everything. We're not sharing everything. There's just not time to share it all. So we're just highlighting. And if you want to really get the meat that is in this book, you need to get this book. Mm -hmm. And I doubt that you'll just sit down and read this cover to cover. But this is so beautiful that you'll set it on your coffee table and you'll flip through it. And every time you flip, look at that page right there. Every time you flip through it, you're going to see the most remarkable things. And you'll think, oh my goodness. It is like an encyclopedia for the first century church. Mm -hmm. it, it, it will just o open the Bible to you. And I want to encourage you to pick one up. But Rick, just the title is encouraging. No Room for Compromise. Oh, and volume three, which I'm working on, is going to have to do with Sardis, Jezebel and Ahab, mm -hmm. Thyatira, mm -hmm. and Sardis. Mm -hmm. And I, I can hardly wait. I've already started on it. But thank you for being with us. Denise, yes. would you pray for our partners? Yes. I, I want to encourage you that if there's nobody standing with you, you feel like you're all alone. Jesus is casting his vote for you. And it's a white stone. And he's in relationship with you. He's got one half of the stone and you've got the other half. Mm, 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 mm. The he two claims of you together you. make one. He claims you by his very covenant, his blood, through that covenant, he claims you. You mm. were bought with a great price. Mm. Thanks, would you pray? Father, we thank you for the word of God. It's so powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing asunder between the soul and the spirit, able to show up the intents and motives of our hearts. And we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, that for we who overcome, that you have hidden manna, and you have a white stone. And Lord, that you see us. You see us running our race. You see us, those in our home group, running their race, no matter how hard it is. You see them running that race. And you have the manna for them. And you have the vote in their approval, that white stone. And Lord, we just thank you for that encouraging word and that comfort that comes from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks for being with us. Amen. We'll see you next week. We love you. Amen.